stand with me. Let's welcome the Lord. There's no other name that's higher than the name of Jesus. Can you say the name of Jesus with me right now? Jesus, we and adore you, Lord. Let's praise the name. Praise the name above all names, the one who reigns forever. Today, Lord, you are so good to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're thankful to lift up the name above all names this morning. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for being with us this morning in service. A few announcements for you. We're going to have a back to school rally this Friday in Palmyra at 515. That's when the van leaves. I believe it's 730. It's actually taking place. So if you are interested, please let Pastor know, let Brother Scott know that you are planning on attending. And next Sunday, we have Brother Bobby Stanley from Dallas, Texas, that's going to be with us. This is our very own Billy Stanley's brother. And so we're excited about that. So please make 
plans to be here and be a part of that. We're going to have a Randolph County Ministerial Alliance Song Fest. This is August 28th. It's on a Sunday at 6 p.m. It's going to be at the Central Christian College. Anytime we have a song fest, it's a wonderful time for different churches in the community to get together to worship God and to celebrate his name. And so please make an effort to be a part of that August 28th. And men's conference is coming up. It's, a, and it's an exciting time for all the guys. If you are interested in being a part of this, this is a three-day event. They're going to have Brother Jason Sisko there. They're going to have Harold Hoffman, Brian Parkey, the Missouri District Superintendent, will be preaching and ministering as well. This is going to be September 15th through the 17th. So please, if you are interested, there's early registration, which I believe is $50. So if you're planning on attending, please let Pastor know. It's a wonderful time to consecrate ourselves unto God, to get into his presence, and have life-changing experiences. And today, our offering designation is going to be for global missions. We have a short video this morning, missionaries from Mato in North Africa. So let's take a look. God is doing a work in Malta. In the Mediterranean, in North Africa and beyond, God is saving souls for his glory. Kirby and Mary Parker have been given a charge to keep, to take God's word and message of salvation into places where faith in Jesus Christ will grow. Under the hand of the enemy, a redeemed people for his name are rejoicing in God their savior. Kirby and Mary Parker are the United Pentecostal Church appointed representatives to five countries, Malta, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. In these five nations, there are literally 90 million souls. The Parker's role was expanded to that of area coordinator to include working in more than 20 nations across North Africa and the Mediterranean Sea, the Middle East, and in the Gulf states. Altogether, the Parkers are working to reach nearly one half billion souls with the good news about Jesus. As pioneers arriving into Malta in 2002, there were no welcoming faces at the airport. No nucleus of saints was expecting their arrival. There was no building for church meetings, no car to drive, and no house to occupy. Yet, God began providing all these things from the beginning. Soon, souls were added to his kingdom. The Parkers have ministered to more than 45 nationalities of people in the Malta church, with the National Maltese Believers helping to see this become a true revival body. While many stories can be told of people who have been saved in Malta from different backgrounds and countries, we would like to tell you Frank's story. Frank came to the Lord Jesus and his kingdom in stages. First, just looking. Then, as a friend. Then, a time of reflecting. Then, of searching. After nearly a lifetime of following the local Roman traditional faith, Frank began to question. What is salvation? How do I receive it? Who is God? How does Jesus fit in? He began to meet with our people, then with our ministers. Then one day, Frank received the gift of the Holy Ghost. He was amazed that he was speaking in tongues. He made the decision to be baptized in water in the name of Jesus. Frank is multi-talented and has been featured on all sorts of media. Now he uses his talents to glorify the Lord Jesus. Thank you, everyone, who has sacrificed that souls might be saved. Thank you for your sacred trust. Together, we take the apostolic message of one God in Christ Jesus to the world. Upon their return to Malta, 
the Parkers hope to finalize the purchase of church property. The growth of the work will progress to the point of becoming a self-sustaining and self-replicating model. That's incredible that by giving to global missions, we can help support the truth of God's gospel going to areas that we may never ever get to step foot on in regions we may never be a part of. But by giving to God's kingdom from here, from anywhere, sending prayers, prayer knows no distance. And so we can help the kingdom of God move forward just by giving by praying, and we are thankful for that today. So we're going to take an offering today for global missions, and we want God's truth to be reached to areas that do not know the truth as we do. And so we're going to have our ushers come today. We're going to pray over this offering that the Lord would bless it. It would be used for its intended purpose, and the Lord would have his perfect way. So would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the opportunity to give. We thank you for being able to give into your kingdom, O oh God. We pray your truth would reach to the uttermost parts of the earth, Lord, and would touch hearts and minds and souls, O oh God, that do not know you, Lord, that you would intervene yourself into them and draw nigh unto them, O oh God. We pray over this offering that you would bless it and multiply it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you give. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me. Praise the Lord, everybody. Aren't you glad that you have salvation in your life? It's good. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Thank you all for being here this morning. I want to take a, take a moment here and just introduce you to somebody that I would like to come and share a little bit of what the Lord is do doing and what the Lord has done in his life. We are, we are honored today to have uh, Brian Sevitz and his wife, Jessica. Welcome, man. Brian is the worship and administrative pastor at Timberlake Christian Church here in town, and we are just so honored for you to be here today, Brother Brian. And we're going to ask you just to share a song with us and testify if you'd like. God bless sure. you. Well, we've gotten to know some great people here from this church. We've been here, uh, well, I've been at Timberlake 15 years, and that's why they gave me uh, several weeks off for sabbatical, and so I haven't led worship for five weeks. I said, I mean, I don't know how to play the piano anymore. Uh, but um, this is a song, that's what I'm going to do for you is a song that I wrote and 
This, uh, I was, uh, Jamie and I led something called Heart of Worship for Area Worship Pastors, um, what was it, a month or two ago, I don't remember now, and we're going to do that again, but this was a song that I shared with them, and it's a song that had no words for like nine years. It was a melody, I said I played it at weddings, I played it at funerals, I played it anywhere and ever, just because I'd written a, a melody in one of my Students one time, uh, I teach some at Central Christian College, and uh, they said, when is that going to have words? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and, and a couple years ago, it finally uh, got some words, and it was just, it, it's really a, a deeply personal song, and yet I think everyone will connect uh, because certain seasons in your life, you go through what this song is talking about. And, and I'm on sabbatical, and there's a lot of, this past week has been crazy because we've been all the way from Chicago to San Francisco and somehow ended up back here yesterday after a 60-hour train ride on Amtrak. <laughs> so uh, it, it's been a crazy uh, few days. But a lot of the sabbatical is inactivity. It's being still, letting the Spirit speak to us, getting refreshed by just coming and worshiping in churches where we don't work and just getting to worship. And so uh, we all need to do that, even if you don't get a chance to take a, you know, a six-week sabbatical. Uh, find ways to be still and let God speak to you, and that's what this song's about. Anxious thoughts, sleepless nights, chaos seems to rule my mind. The waves come crashing in, darkness deep within. Will this pain ever end? By these chains I am bound. It sometimes seems like I may drown. Then I turn my eyes to you Cause you always see me through And then your peace I find And I'll be still to hear your voice Rising up above the north Your spirit to enjoy And in your presence I'll rejoice In those times I'm just confused Help me hold on to your truth I know you're there And I know you care You're working all things for my good And I'll be still to hear your voice rising up above the noise your spirit to enjoy and in your presence I'll rejoice
your spirit to enjoy and in your presence I rejoice I'll be still to hear your voice rising up above the noise your spirit to Thank you, brother. That was wonderful. I love those lyrics. I know you're there. I know you care. I'll be still to hear your voice. Powerful stuff. Thank you. Today, this morning, we want to go to prayer, and we want to take a few needs. Remember, this week, we are praying for our teachers. School is about to start. We want to cover our teachers our administrators in prayer. We want to ask the Lord to give them wisdom, give them grace. They're dealing with a lot of issues. A lot of things are against them per se. And we want the Lord to give them peace, give them wisdom for the school year, for individual kids. And so it's always a good time to pray for your schools, pray for the children that are attending. Also, we want to pray for Patsy Bolin family, This is a relative that had passed away from Polly Ripple. And so we want to keep them in prayers, ask the Lord to give them peace today. We also have, this is from Mike and Julie, a Muslim co-worker of a Kingdom Builders member, an offender asked if Kingdom Builders would pray for his daughter, Ashley, who needs a kidney transplant. This Muslim heard that Kingdom Builders knows how to get a hold of God. That ain't a testimony right there. We want to pray for Ashley today that the Lord would do a miracle in her life and touch this brother that is going through this and knowing that people are getting a hold of God. And what a testimony that others can pray on his behalf. Like I said before, prayer knows no distance that can reach right where Ashley is and God can get all of the glory. We also want to remember Sister Patty Dodd this morning in the hospital. She had uh, a lot of fluid in her body, and so we want the Lord to touch her. The Lord is more than able to do so. We can call upon his name right now. And in a moment, the Lord can touch each and every one of these situations. So if you would stand with me, we want to lift these needs up. We want the Lord to do a miraculous work, and we want to thank him for doing it. So can you pray with us about these needs we have heard? Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, we can come before your throne this morning. Lord, you are our ultimate hope, Lord. We look to you this morning, O oh God, and we commit every one of these needs that are lifted up before you. Lord, we're giving you an opportunity today to show your power, to show your glory, Jesus. Lord, we pray for the Polly Ripple, the Patsy Bolin family, Lord, that you would give them peace this morning, oh God. Lord, you would touch that family, oh God, and give them comfort right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Patty Dodd this morning, Lord, right in the hospital where she's at. We're asking your healing touch to come upon her and saturate her with healing this morning. Lord, you're more than able to do so. We give you the glory for doing it, oh God. Give her peace right now. Give her comfort. Give the doctors wisdom, oh God. Let your glory be, Lord, shown in her situation in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Sister Ashley this morning, oh God. You see, she needs a kidney transplant, Lord. Lord, we're trusting you that this Muslim has reached out, oh God. 
and he has heard that your people know how to call upon your name. We're asking for a divine work to be done, Lord. We're asking for a healing work to be done in this daughter, in this dad, in this family, Lord, to show yourself strong. Lord, that your name would be glorified. Lord, that people would turn to you as their source of strength. And we worship you for doing it, Lord. We thank you for doing it. And we praise you in advance, oh God. And thank you for all the good reports and being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for praying. It makes a difference. You may be seated. Falling in love with you.
know the blood that Jesus shed for me and you. Kids are you and me the terrain from day to day it will never 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 lose its power.
under your blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. TPC, can you let out one more grateful roar of praise right now? Woo! Hallelujah. 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 Get me seated if you want. How many of the Lord's been your provider? He's been Jehovah Jireh. He's been your rose of Sharon and brought beauty to your life where there didn't used to be beauty. Fairest of 10,000. Healer of the brokenhearted. Woo! Lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh, he's been Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Provider, defender, master of the universe. You know me.
anyone brought their Bible to the house of the Lord today? All right, got a few of you. If you're electronic in your approach to the Word of God, I'm not going to not going to hold that against you. Thank you. My pastor used to tell me that it was important to bring your Bible to church because you couldn't take notes on the screen. Well, what he doesn't, well, he's long past, but <laughs> he doesn't know that today you can make notes on your screen. So, uh, 
If you need to make notes on your screen today, go right ahead. But this morning, I want to start a sermon series on the four foundational stones that our faith relies on in order to survive. Many of you, no doubt, have probably seen the uh, illustrative point of filling your life up with stuff. If you've seen that, it's the guy with the jar, and he puts the big rocks in there, and then he, he asks the class, is this jar full? And some say yes, some say no. And then he takes a little bit of gravel and puts it in there, and it kind of shifts around the rocks. And he's like, is it full now? And they're like, well, you know, they're kind of getting, you know, they're seeing where he's going. No, it's not full. And then he puts sand in it. Is it still full? No, it's not full yet. And then, he puts water in it, and then it's full. And so you've, if you've seen that, but then also the part of the story is this, is that you can't reverse the process. You can't take all those ingredients and do it backwards because it doesn't work. You can't put the water in, same amount of water, you can't put the same amount of sand, same amount of gravel, and then try to fit the big rocks in because it doesn't work that way. And so in our walk with God, You've got to get some big things in position first. Yeah. And so there are big things that are, and there are also smaller things that we fill our faith up with, and all of them are necessary to experience the fulfilling work in the kingdom of God that we feel whenever we live for the Lord. But there are some big things that we got to get in position in our hearts and our minds first and allow to allow or to build everything else around them. And so I will... What I'm going to be giving to you in the next few weeks is a short sermon series on the four foundational stones that as believers we must use to build our faith upon. And those four foundation stones are, number one, the Bible. The Bible. The Word of God. You've got to have a relationship with the Word of God. As a pastor, my experience has been people who don't read the Word typically don't pray. It's just, in my personal experience, that's the way it has kind of been revealed to me. People who don't pray are also people who don't read the Bible, and people that don't read the Bible typically don't pray either. So it's important for us to put that Bible first in everything, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But number two, the second stone would be the stone of salvation. Salvation is important. It's the most important thing you'll ever do in your life outside of marrying the right person. Salvation is everything, and so we want to know a little bit about that, and we'll, we'll get to that later on in the month. And then holiness, how we should live in the world of men and before God and man, and so holiness is important to God. The Bible reiterates that over and over, and how there needs to be an inward holiness and an outward holiness. Also, the fourth stone is the oneness of God, and we need to have an understanding of who God is and who we are in relationship to Him as children of God. And so those four things, the Bible, salvation, holiness, and the oneness of God are the four things that we're going to focus on this month. And so this morning we're going to start with the foundation stone of God's Word, the Bible. And if you got your Bible, why don't you open up your Bible to Psalms chapter 119, Psalms 119 and 11. I'll give you a second to turn there. Or to type that in. Psalms 119 is the longest chapter in Scripture. Interestingly enough, right there next to it is Psalm 118, which is the center chapter of all the chapters in the 66 books of the Bible. And then 117 is the shortest chapter in all of Scripture. All right there, just a little trivial nugget for you. Psalm 119 and 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. There's an importance about God's word. Let's jump over to the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. 2 Peter 1 and 20. Just giving us some more context here before I get going about the Word of God and what it is and how we should approach it. Second Peter 1 and 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. 
a half a dozen times on the Bible's first page, no fewer, no fewer than nine times in the very first chapter of the Bible does the Bible declare that God said. And you should never doubt that it makes a big difference what God says. Uh, because His words are spirit. His words are life. His words are, are light. And, and unbelievably to many today in the world that you and I occupy, the Bible remains to a lot of people an anonymity. It's like this enigma. It's a mystery. And I, I've come to tell you this morning that the Bible is more than a mysterious book. It's more than just a neat idea. But the Bible is truth. And it will set you free. If you are bound up by a situation, you can look to the Word of God and find the answer. Can I get an amen this morning? What you don't know about that book is already hurting you. Your life is less than what it could be if the Bible is not in your life. So let's talk about that foundation stone of God's Word. If you got your Bible, grab it. If it's on your device, maybe you can hold that up. And let's just thank God for His Word before we jump into it. Lord Jesus, I thank You for Your Word and what it represents to each and every one of us as believers in this place today. I'm praying, Lord, that your word, Lord, would speak to us, Lord, and as we gather around it this morning, that you would do a work inside of each and every heart and every mind in this room. Lord, let your spirit have its way. Lord, we ask that your anointing would be upon us in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Because the Arctic region of North America, that's the area between Alaska and Greenland, all across the top of North America. It is dominated by vast uh, level plains of tundra that stretch for miles and miles as far as the eye can see. There are few natural landmarks in that, in that kind of topography. There, there's not much there. There's not many trees in the tundra. And so it's just stretches of, of tundrous plain that you just see over in and for this reason, over many, many, many years, the native peoples in this area have used stones as landmarks for navigation. They've used them as a point of reference or a marker for food caches or whatever have you in order to survive. They, they call these stones, the gathering of these stones and the, the, uh, uh, the, the way they stack them in that it's a, basically a, a group of stones that has significance. They call it a nookshnook. Anukshnuk. Anukshnuk is a, is a uh, Native American term of the far north. And many of those things are built in the shape of a man to indicate that these things just didn't fall into place on their own. But these things represent something. These things mean that someone has passed by this way before. To a wanderer in the wilderness of unending tundra, a nookshnook, or the gathering of stones, are a welcome sight. Those stones could give you directions if you're lost. If they, they could be a comfort in reminding you that you're maybe on the right path, or maybe they could be a reminder that you are not alone. In the book of Joshua, a similar monument was erected when the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan River into their promised land. Because God wanted them to remember the heritage that their forefathers had given to them and to know that someone had passed by that way before. In Joshua 4 and 21 it says, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry ground. The Bible tells us that the Lord told Joshua, He said, you tell every one of the elders to grab them a stone out of the middle of the Jordan River and we're going to stack them on the other side because you're about to walk through on dry ground and you're going to inherit the promise that I have for you. I wonder this morning if, if, if there's somebody that you've, you've got a, you got something that you've been doing with your life in regards to the Word of God and that you're going to pass that on for future generations. You're going to set up a monument with the Word of God in your home. I think about those men who grabbed those stones. Who did you choose as an elder? 
You know, think about this. Coming down from the high command of Joshua, choose you a man to gather a stone. I'm not going to go ask a five-year-old to go and get the stone that's going to represent my tribe for future generations. I'm going to go and ask the biggest boy. (laughs) I need you to get the biggest rock because we're not going to put a pebble over here on the other side of the Jordan River because what we have experienced, what we're about to step into is something that we've been living for, that we've been looking forward to, that we have generations of us have endured to get to this point and we're not about to just let it just be a little pebble that we're going to put on the other side it's going to be a stone a stone that's going to represent something in the new testament church we have we also have been given a great heritage passed on to us by faithful men and women who have left us a firm foundation we can never forget where we have come from or we will never be able to get to where God wants us to go. 21st century Christians need to know without a doubt that the things we believe are not just man's ideas. These are God ideas. These are things that are found, that are absolute foundational truths that are discovered in God's word. Amen? Amen. 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 You can preach with me this morning. It's okay. <laughs> Ephesians 2 and 20 tells us that What we believe is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. This morning we look at our first of the four foundational stones, the Bible. Isaiah 40 and 8 says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Everything eventually will lose its power in this earth except for the word of God nations and empires kings and kingdoms governments and dictators alike all of them eventually lose their influence and they lose their power and we read about them in the history books but the word of God still remains today I don't know about you but I'm excited about the word of God this morning I'm excited about the saving word that came to my life, that the gospel message was preached to me, and that my parents came in in a revival, and that there was something that changed my family tree, and it was the preached word of that book right there. It changed everything for us. Everything changed. The question that we must all answer is what will we allow to lead us in this walk of life what's going to guide you will it be the theologies and the attitudes of this world which changes with every changing generation or will it be the forever settled and never changing steadfast word of god the truth is we all must make a choice how are you going to raise your family What is it that you're going to do for yourself? How are you going to raise yourself as you go out of your parents' home, young people, and you're going to go into this world? Is the Word of God going to be a guiding force in your life, or are you just going to be according to whatever it is you're feeling, you know, that desire, or whatever it is that makes you happy at the time? You've got to have something that gives you the true north in your life. The Word of God is the true north. The Word of God is everything to us. The Bible is a steadfast collection of God-inspired writings that help us navigate all of the complexities of life. I'll say that again. That needs an amen with it. Because the Bible is a steadfast collection of God-inspired writings that help us navigate every complex problem, situation, circumstance, crisis, whatever it is that you got going on in your life, that book has an answer for you this morning. Psalms 119 and 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But there is a principle that governs us in the word of God. And it's that it is given to us every day as we walk in God's truth. As you open the Bible, I hope every morning you read something before you walk out the door. You do that. Why do we do that? Why do we read our Bible every day? Why do we start every day with prayer? Because whenever you do that, you seize the day. (laughs) Oh, man. You seize the day in prayer. You seize the day. You begin the day with prayer and God's word. You're preemptively attacking whatever it is that the enemy set a trap for you in that day with. It's like, it's like he's already gone into the day and he's already set some things up. He's been working all week on it. He's worked all weekend for what it is that he has in store for you this week. 
But what you do is you just simply open up the Word of God. And you open up your heart and your voice in prayer every single morning. And you open up an opportunity for God to take dominion over whatever it is that the enemy has prepared for you. Because that's the power of the spoken Word of God. It's amazing what the Word of God can do. And so it shines in front of us and it illuminates. It's a lamp unto our feet and it shines the light ahead of us. And so in other words, the Bible will always provide answers for our future. It will always provide light and illumination and revelation and understanding with every step of faith that you take in your life as long as those steps are lined up with His Word. So the question is this, what is our relationship supposed to be with the Word of God? 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us about this. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I believe that. And it is profitable. In other words, it benefits you for four different reasons. It benefits you for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, And for instruction in righteousness. Four things that the Bible gives to us. We say, well, what's doctrine? Doctrine is what to believe. The Bible tells us what we should believe. That's doctrine. What you believe is your doctrine. So it tells us, it gives us doctrine. It tells us what to believe. But it also gives us reproof. What is reproof? Reproof is what not to believe. It tells us what to believe, and it also tells us what not to believe. But then it takes it even a step further, and it gives us correction. What is correction? Correction is how not to behave. So it tells you what to think. It tells you what not to think. It tells you how you should act, but it also gives you instruction in righteousness. What is that? That tells me how I should be acting. I don't know about you, but that's pretty simple. It tells me what to believe, what not to believe. It tells me how to behave and how not to behave. The Word of God gives all four of those things to us throughout all the Scriptures. So, the problem is, is we have a large percentage of, of people, and I would even go as far to cross over into the statistics of the Christian world, that we have a large percentage of the Christian denominations today in North America that do not believe that the Bible is an inspired book. But it is a great piece of working literature and that it's not inspired. Studies have shown that 85% of Americans have more than one translation of the Bible in their homes. That's pretty impressive at 85%. That they have more than one Bible in their home and one, more than one translation. And if you're a King James only or you're whatever it is, it, you know, God bless you. I, I pray the Lord to help you with that. But I'm telling you today that the Lord speaks to us through his word, no matter what it is, whether it's written in Latin, whether it's written in Greek, whether it's written in Hebrew, whether it's written in English, whether it's written in Old English, whether it's written in the message version of the new uh, slang or whatever it is you want to call it. I mean, there's something about God's word that will speak to you. And so they have 85% of Americans have more than one translation of the Bible in their homes. And although they hold the Bible in high regard, they don't read it. And it's timeless truths and its promises are locked away in those pages on the bookshelf. It's just sitting on that bookshelf in their very home where they struggle themselves with questions about life. And living and meeting the needs that life seems to demand from us. And their lives are literally burglarized from the answers that are waiting to be discovered within the pages that are simply just a few steps away. I've come to tell you this morning that the Bible is more than just a cool idea. It is truth. And what you don't know about it is already hurting you. Your life is less than what it could be because the Bible is not in it. You need to get the Bible in your life. You need to get the Bible in your family. You need to get the Bible out. (laughs) How about that? Let's just start right there. We just got to get the Bible out. We got to open those pages up and begin to read some of those stories. Those stories have been preserved for a reason for us. The Holy Scriptures are more than conjecture. But they are the foundation of our faith. 
A faith that stands on more than just the testimony of a past generation or more than just a, a group of overwhelmingly sentimental believers that have, ha have given it to us. Our faith does not rest on the rock of someone else's recollection. It doesn't rest on the musings of some kind of mortal mind of some man somewhere. Our faith does not stand on sentiment or emotion, but our faith, it stands on the infallible, forever settled Word of our God. And I've come, you, come here this morning to remind you and to tell you that I believe in that book. Does anybody believe in the Bible today? I'm trying to get you excited about the book because this is the roadmap to glory. If you ain't got a relationship with the Word of God, I'd question your relationship with God Himself. You got to get in the book. It'll tell you what you need to know about God. When the priest entered into the temple that day and set the Ark of the Covenant so carefully into its place, pulling out the staves that had carried it for so many years, they stepped aside in 1 Kings chapter 8. It reminds us that that sacred symbol of the Ark of the Covenant had been pillaged. It had been broken into by the invaders. That holy box had been plundered by heathen hands as Jerusalem was conquered. And out of it, they had taken the golden pot of manna. They had taken the symbol of God's blessing and provision out of the Ark of the Covenant. They had taken Aaron's rod that almond branch which budded and represented God's miraculous power and authority. And the only thing left behind in the Ark of the Covenant on that day, the only thing that remains in the Ark was the tablets of stone. Seemingly worthless rocks to the heathen with what little writing they had on them and scratched in there those Ten Commandments. They left them there. They left the Word in the box. But the Word was enough. Because without the manna, that's the blessing and provision of God, and without the budding rod of Aaron, that's the miraculous power of God, the Ten Commandments, which was the Word of God, was enough. So that whenever the priest stepped away that day from that burglarized box, the Bible tells us that the glory of God came down in that temple and it filled all the sanctuary into such a, an effect that the men of God could not even stand to minister because the word was enough to bring the glory back to the house. They had taken Aaron's rod that budded and which represented that miraculous power and, and all those things that, were, that, were, that we really want. But here we had just only the Word of God. And you have to understand because where the Word of God is, there's power. And where the Word of God was that day, the power of God fell. I've come to speak to someone whose life has been burglarized by circumstances. Maybe this morning you walked in here with a crisis on your mind. A heaviness on your heart this morning. The world has stolen from, from you some things and you no longer see that pot of manna. You don't see the blessing and the favor of God coming at you like you have in times past. Or maybe you're, you're not feeling so blessed this morning. Maybe you no longer behold Aaron's rod and you don't feel the miraculous manifestation of God's power in your life any longer. If that's where you're at, I've got a word for you today. You may feel like you're incomplete, but I've come here to tell you this morning that you still have God's word. And it's enough to bring the glory back into the house. It's enough to bring the glory of God down in your circumstance. All you got to do is get close to the Word. Start getting into the Word of God and watch and see the Word of God change the atmosphere of whatever it is that you're dealing with this morning. And if you have God's Word, then you have the Word of the King. And where the Word of the King is... There is power, there is authority, there is, there is strength, there is everything that you need where the Word of the King is. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the Word of the King of Glory that I have access to. All i got to do is get in this book and I can step into the throne room of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I could just enter into His presence just by simply getting a hold of His Word. 
Why don't you grab your Bible and lift it up and just tell the Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word this morning, Jesus. Thank you for what it represents to us today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. This opening remark of the, in the Gospel of John lets me know that before anything was created, before there was ever even a mountain to climb or even a man to climb it, there was this word, and this word was sharp, and this word was quick, and it was able to divide asunder between soul and spirit. It was, there's this powerful word that was there in the beginning, and, and this word that I, that, that I, that, that I, I have my hand upon today, it is, it is the written uh, word of God, and that it means something. It, it, it has come to me through great sacrifice, this book. It has come to me at such a great cost. There were so many people who have died to make sure that this could be available to us today. It's hard to, to contemplate all of it. This book was written on two continents in several countries. Some were hundreds of miles apart. It was written in the deserts of Sinai and other parts of the wilderness in Judea. It was pinned in the caves and the prison houses. It was written on the desert isles of Patmos and in the palaces of Zion. This strange mosaic of timeless truths emerges to us from diverse areas and from diverse ages and from diverse cultures, every one of them contributing to the overall plot and theme of this book. There's no other literary phenomenon in human history that can compare to the Bible that you may have in your hand or near you this morning. Not only was it written in a diversity of locations, but it was written in a diversity of languages. It was written in Aramaic and Greek and Hebrew. Some of the writers wrote hundreds of years apart. Some of it was written 1,500 years before the individual who would even end it was even born. It's an amazing book. It spans over 16 centuries of time. It comes from kings on thrones and from shepherds in fields. It, it's the Word of God and it was diverse before diversity was even ever a thing. <laughs> diverse is the Bible. These words were divinely inspired of God, but they were put down by princes and they were put there by publicans and prophets and priests and poets and fishermen. What, what's the point, Pastor? The point is, the same Spirit that moved upon Moses was the same Spirit that moved upon Peter and the same Spirit that moved upon Paul and moved upon David and moved upon all the prophets who wrote. The same Spirit. That's why when you read the book, you can find there's a continuity of narrative that is threaded throughout the ages Regardless of the diversity of location, diversity of culture, the diversity of time, it did not matter. Because the same God is writing through it all. These words were divinely inspired of God, but they were put down there by all different kinds of people. They wrote in tents and they wrote in cities. They wrote in, the, in palaces. They wrote in dungeons. They wrote when times were good. They wrote when times were bad. They wrote all kinds of things. They, they were given to us. And I am at all inspired because we are so blessed. It's such a miracle to have access to today. That book right there, the Bible. It's a foundation stone of our faith. We should hold such a physical miracle in high regard. This is a physical miracle you hold in your hands if you have a book today. Or maybe even on your device you can call it a miracle. It's just you have access to the Word of God. We've never lived in a time where we have more access to the Bible than we do today. You got it on tablets. You can have it on your computer. You got it in the book form. You got it everywhere. You can access the Bible in seconds. You just got to Google it. Boom, you're right there. Portal open. Bible available. But never has it been less read. 
and less revered than what it is today. Think about that. We've never had more access to it, but because of ease of access, perhaps we've gone lax in how we reverence the Bible. We should always hold that miracle of the Scriptures in high regard. We don't treat that book like any other book. It's not a coaster for your coffee cup. It's not a paperweight for your pile. It's the Word of God, and it's to be reverenced and respected, for in it are the words of life. That book right there is the roadmap to glory, and that's what I've got to have. Because whenever I look at the suffering of this world and everything that you and I endure in this thing that we call life, I want to know that it's going to be worth it all one day. That book tells me it is. My kids know that nothing goes on top of the Bible. The Bible is always placed on top of everything else. We, we do that to illustrate that there is nothing that supersedes or is elevated over the writings that are found in that book. That book means everything to us. That book is everything. If you're, if you're going to build your life on something, if you're going to build your family on something, if you're going to go be putting your hope into something, if you're going to go believing on something, you need to let it be this book right here. You need to let it be the Bible because the Bible has the words of life and it has the word of truth. It is a foundational stone in our faith. It should be not just a foundation stone to our faith. It needs to be a foundation stone to our family and even to our culture and our country. Amen. Amen. So what's to come from such a montage of writings and diversity of locations? I mean, there's a lot of diversity there when you consider the fact that a fisherman's writing, the wisest of men is writing, Prophets are writing, like all these people are writing. It should be a confusing mess of discord and chaos. But no, it's not. It's got one form of doctrine. It's got one system of ethics. <laughs> it's got one plan of salvation. It's got one rule of faith. It's got one preeminent person throughout it. And it's got one Lord. It's got one faith. It's got one baptism. It's got one God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in us all. There's a continuity there, my friend, in the Scriptures. And someone needs to know that you can build your life upon that book. On every page throughout all 66 books is one person, Jesus Christ. You can see him when Abraham offers Isaac upon the altar. You can see him whenever the brazen serpent is raised in the wilderness. You can see him whenever Joseph is sold for silver. Jesus is foreshadowed in every one of those stories. He's on every page. He's, he's in Adam at the beginning. He's in Aaron the high priest. He's in David the king of his people. And all of them were but foreshadowings of the substance that was to come in Jesus Christ. Noah's ark, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the water that flowed from the flint rock, all of them, the manna that came down from on high, the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night, all of them find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Every one of those stories point to Jesus. And if all these amazing illustrations, and if all these amazing times and places and people have their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, how is it that you and I think that we could be fulfilled outside of Him? We can't. Acts 17 and 28 reminds us of that. For in Him we live and move and have our very being. Jesus Christ was the revealed image of the invisible God. And he said this, he said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, but abide forever. What man creates, man can destroy. But every effort to diminish this book has failed. Everyone who spoke about its, de its demise is gone. And here we sit with the Bible in our hands. This book is a miracle of, of God and a gift to us as believers and as the church. Every miracle that we have tasted, every move of God that we have experienced, 
every church service that has transformed your life has been based out of this book. Think about that. Everything that you have felt that has changed and transformed you as a Christian, as a believer, has been based off what we read and what we teach and what we preach out of this book. Every promise, every glory, every miracle that is ever experienced has flowed from our understanding of that book. And what you don't know about it is keeping you from what you need the most. According to the Apostle Paul, God's word is never bound, not by time nor by circumstance. You and I can be bound physically, financially, socially, intellectually, circumstantially. We could, I mean, you go through them all, spiritually, emotionally. There's a lot of ways for you to be bound. <laughs> There's a lot of ways that you can be bound. But we, we can be bound, yes, but the word of God, it's never bound. How do I know that? Isaiah 55 and 10 Reminds us, for as the rain comes and the snow falls from heaven and returns not, but it waters the earth and makes it to spring forth in bud so that it may give seed to the sower and bread to those that want to eat, so shall my word go forth out of my mouth. This is the Lord saying, and it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in that thing whereunto I sent it. In other words, when I say something, it's going to get done. It's not bound by time. It's not bound by space. It's not bound by the world of men. You need to be encouraged today to know that God watches over his word to perform it. it, it by, by whoever, wherever, whenever, he is watching over his word to perform it. And it may take days. It may take years. It may take decades. But every promise that is in that book is going to come to pass. Does anybody believe that today? On the last page, I need to wrap this up. On the last page of the last book in the Bible is one word that opens up the floodgate of salvation for every one of us who's willing to obey God's word. There's literally one word that stops hell dead in its tracks. It's found in Revelation 22, verse 17. It's at the close of Scripture here that we discover this. The Bible says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life free. It's the same let that is on the Bible's first page that we discover there at the end. When it says, let there be light, that means that it's not a suggestion. When God said, let there be light, darkness had no other recourse. God said, let there be. When God said, let, guess what's going to happen? Nothing is going to become something when God says, let it be. And so that's what we discover there at the end. It's a command. It's not a suggestion or an invitation as many of us may think whenever we read that. It's like, oh, isn't that nice? He's inviting everybody to come. No. Let him who is a thirst. Let him who is hungry. Let whosoever will take of the water of life freely. If you have a desire to get a hold of God, God is saying to the kingdom of darkness, through the word of God, right there at the end, he closes it up and says, Hell, if any one of my kids, no matter how weak they may be, no matter how strong you may feel that you are against them, no matter what it is that you have done to them, if they have a desire to come to me, let him who is a thirst come. Let him who is broken come. Let him who needs me, let him come. And there's nothing you can do about it. It is a command to darkness just as it was in the beginning. It's a command to darkness in the end. It was God speaking just as he did in the beginning by commanding every form of darkness to stand aside and let the weakest sinner 
in humanity that is willing to come to the cross of Calvary, to come to an altar of repentance, to come. There's nothing more vital and more valuable than the Word of God. It's a non-negotiable foundational stone in our walk with Him. Let's stand together if you would. We're told in the Scriptures in Psalms 119.89, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. The only thing is that we aren't in heaven. Not yet, yeah. I find a lesson in this passage because just because something is settled in heaven doesn't necessarily mean that it's settled in the earth. You don't have to look very hard to figure out what is true in eternity is not always true in time. What's true in heaven is not always true on the earth. So sometimes these same promises that help us can also kind of haunt us. We read this book and we see the vast difference between what we read and our reality. Can I get an amen? amen. We understand that there's a dichotomy between the promise of God that we find in Scripture and our performance. Between His Word and our ways. Between our expectation and our actual experience. And many times we become confounded. We come, become confused as to how and why. But there is an answer. This prophetic book, the Bible, promises that it is forever settled and permanently recorded in heaven. Jesus called it a seed. That means the word of promise is conception. Except before any one of us can play with the baby, we got to get that thing to birth. we got to bring it to birth. And before our expectation can become our experience. Before realization is ever understood as our actual reality. Before it, it is ever settled in earth we have to pray it to pass Jesus said behold I send you the promise of the Father upon you in the book of Acts and in the same breath he says now go tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high it was settled in heaven what Jesus said to his disciples the promise was going to come but they had to go to an upper room get a hold of God in prayer to bring it to pass on earth. Promise in heaven? Yeah. But it's not promised in earth quite yet. But if you just get a hold of God in prayer, His promise will show up. Sometimes like a mighty rushing wind, it'll come into your dark corner and it'll wash you over and you'll feel His glory embellishing you. 1 Kings 18, the prophet Elisha told Ahab, you better go, King Ahab, before, because I hear a sound of the abundance of rain. And in the very next verse, what does he do? He walks up the hill and begins to pray for rain. Rain was promised in heaven, but it had not been realized yet on earth. It took prayer to make the rain come to pass. The word had been spoken, but he had to pray in order that it would come to pass. Don't read that. Don't, don't read that and say, well, God, my God, it's not true. Not true. It's all true. Everything you read in that book is true. I just have to get in there and find it and speak it and pray it to pass. I close with this. Deuteronomy 30 and 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it afar off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it? and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea 
which thou should say, who shall go over to the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But the Word, everybody say the Word. The Word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. In other words, God has given us a promise in His Word and all we got to do is speak it out in prayer. All we got to do is just speak it out in prayer. And this morning, as we have talked about the foundational stone of God's Word, I wonder, is there anybody here this morning, you've got some promises that you've been locked on to. you got some things in your life that you need some help with. And you need God's Word to come forth in your life. God's Word tells me He's a way maker. He's a promise keeper. He is faithful. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Whatever it is you need from God, you can have it this morning. I'm opening this altar for whosoever will. I don't know what your need is, but you do. And God's here this morning. He wants to connect with you today. You need to come and find yourself a a place to pray because this is the moment between you and God. This is a moment where you can connect with your Maker. You can hold Him to His promise. You can hold God to His Word at this time. Because God, Your Word is enough. As we begin to sing, I want you to begin to communicate to the Lord and tell the Lord, Lord, I trust your word. Your word says that I can be healed, so I trust you for healing this morning. Your word says that I can be made whole, and so, Lord, I'm asking for that wholeness today. Come on, somebody, let's just reach out to him in prayer this morning. I commit it to you today, Jesus. Whatever it is I need, I can just ask it, Lord, and I can have it. Your word never fails. Your word doesn't ever pass away, but it stands forever. Jesus, help us this morning. We need you today. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. So word of God speak, but you pour down like rain. My eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of Washing 